tela, onde pode ler mais. E escolha interpretação de idiomas. Escolha a língua e clique em feito. Obrigada. Thank you. So welcome everyone. My name is Osprey Oreo Lake and I'm the executive director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. And please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. We're really honored to have all of you be with us today. We can is hosting this event with our partner Reaction Climatica, who is based in Bolivia. And this is a formal side event during the historic gathering of the first conference of parties for the Escazu Agreement. And we're really honored to be here and to participate and advocate. Um, after open remarks, I will introduce our esteemed panelists who will make presentations and then we're going to have time for questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to give some background because uh, for some of you, this will be new information and for others, it will be also a way to catch up to where we stand today with the agreement. Across Latin America and the Caribbean, women land defenders each carry their own stories of persecution and violence as they protect forests, waters, climate and communities. But uh, now a very transformative multilateral agreement, which is called the Escazo Agreement, has the potential to provide a promising path forward. Latin America is one of the deadliest regions for environmental land defenders. In the Americas in 2020, 284 human rights defenders were killed that were recorded, accounting for 86% of the global tally, according to data published by the campaign group Frontline Defenders. Colombia, which has signed the Escazo Agreement, was the deadliest country for land rights activists and environmentalists in 2020, as we reported by uh, Global Witness, another advocacy group. So combined with entrenched colonial and patriarchal policies, individuals threatened are often indigenous peoples and women environmental and human rights defenders. Frontline and indigenous women are frequently the backbones of their communities, knowledge keepers of biodiversity and forests and leaders in resistance efforts to defend their lands. And unfortunately, the threats experienced by women land defenders are not unusual. The protection of natural areas goes hand in hand with indigenous rights. Yet largely, there has been really a lack of political will at the national and international levels to implement policies and frameworks that ensure the rights and protections of environmental defenders, including their access to decision-making, public information, and justice mechanisms. However, this is really good news right now. We have a unique and transformative agreement that could provide a promising path forward. In 2018, countries of Latin America and the Caribbean heeded the calls of civil society and adopted the Regional Agreement for Access to Information, to Public Participation and Access, to justice on environmental issues in Latin America and the Caribbean, also known as the Escazu Agreement. And this agreement is a precedent setting multilateral accord guaranteeing access rights on environmental matters. And what's really important is it has the explicit protection of human rights and environmental defenders. It's grounded in principle 10 of the Rio Declaration of the Earth Summit of 1992 and the Escazu Agreement is a legally binding document that does not allow any revisions by ratifying countries and takes into account vulnerable populations and environmental defenders as a central focus. Uh, we know from many studies uh, that the most effective ways to protect biodiverse regions like the Amazon rainforest is to protect the rights and sovereignty of indigenous peoples. So by protecting the rights of indigenous land defenders, the Escazo Agreement is a very potentially powerful mechanism that can re reinforce efforts to stop environmental degradation, mitigate the climate crisis and human rights violations. The Escazo Agreement was adopted two years ago, two years, excuse me, two years after the murder of Honduran environmental activist, Betty Caceres, and at its core, the agreement carries the dedication and spirit of women's defense of the land. The accord aims to carry on the legacy of Betty Caceres, as well as the struggles of thousands of land defenders, particularly women across the LAC region that stand up against extractivism and injustices. 
and a region hard hit by climate impacts and extractive industries where femicides, domestic violence, and economic insecurity are, are really on the rise right now, we're witnessing women from all generations take to the streets and to courtrooms to fight for collective liberation and environmental protection. On April 22nd, 2021, on Earth Day, the Escazo Agreement actually came into full effect. And now we enter the implementation phase here at the first COP for Escazu. Signatories and ratifying countries are convening at this first conference of parties to discuss financial provisions and rules of procedure moving forward. And this comes after years of organizing by indigenous communities, environmental women and human rights activists and policymakers in the LAC region um, that internationally have finally come to fruition this week. Women are not only leading the fight for environmental and climate justice and progressive environmental policies, but are also the visionaries of alternative solutions at this critical time of multiple expanding crises. So with proper implementation of the Escazo Agreement, no more women land defenders will be violently censored, and instead their voices can lead us to the healthy and just world that we seek. And this is why we can and many other groups, Reaction Own Climatica and others are partnering with a steering committee of women from the LAC region to implement a campaign that includes education in communities, advocacy at the government level and attorney research in each country. And on that note, we can is really excited to announce today during this historic, historic um, COP event that we're launching a new phase of our campaign. We have partnered with the Vance Center for over a year, where law firms from six countries have assessed key legal levers for implementing the Escazo Agreement country by country. And we're opening this important research to the public in three languages. Um, so we're dropping this launch this week on, for, with a new website. And we hope that this information will greatly benefit women in the region. And we're gonna go ahead and put that link into the chat right now. And of course we will be sharing it on our website. So it's really incredible research that really looks country by country at how women can best implement the Escazo Agreement in their country according to local law. Uh, so with that, for the earth and women land defenders, we stand together. And we will now go to our panelists. Um, we're so honored to have each of you here. Some of them are on the ground right now uh, in Chile where the COP is taking place. So we're going to be hearing directly from leaders on the ground, including uh, our uh, wonderful weekend representative, Carmen Caprilla. So it's just really thrilling that we could all be joined together today to, to honor this moment. And with that, I'd love to have Patricia Galinga who is a Quechua leader. Uh, she is uh, an indigenous leader from Sariaco in Ecuador. She's a spokeswoman for Mujeres Amazonica Defensoras de la Silva. And I welcome you, Patricia. We were so honored that you could join us from Ecuador. Thank you. Muchísimas. I, me, remind people to click interpretation at the bottom. Please go ahead. Muchísimas gracias, Ofre. Buenas tardes a todas las hermanas. Eh, realmente es un honor participar de este panel sobre el Acuerdo de Escazú y desde la Amazonía. Como ustedes saben, la Amazonía en estos años ha sido vulnerado terriblemente el tema ambiental, los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, porque en nuestros territorios hay petróleo y los gobiernos, a pesar de toda la discusión a nivel global de que los combustibles fósiles han desestabilizado el clima, continúan apostando a un modelo económico extractivista, petróleo, minería, hidroeléctrica, hasta la de bosques. Y eso sigue vigente. Hace dos años que el Ecuador firmó el Acuerdo de Escazú para proteger a los defensores, para que podamos tener acceso a la información, para que exista justicia, para que pueda haber mayor protección a los ecosistemas y podamos vivir en un ambiente sano. Si se ha cumplido eso, en la realidad no. Nuestros países son expertos en firmar acuerdos, convenios internacionales que no se aplican en territorio. 
Lo que sí hay que recalcar de que el acuerdo de Escazú viene a fortalecer los derechos con los que hemos luchado. Viene a fortalecer el derecho a la consulta libre, previa e informada que tiene que ver con el consentimiento y la autodeterminación de los pueblos indígenas. Viene a fortalecer ambiental. Disculpen. Yes, all good. Bueno. Please continue. Lo que estoy diciendo es que el acuerdo de Escazú viene a fortalecer aquellos derechos con los que nosotros hemos luchado. Porque se señala exactamente el tema ambiental y el peligro que tenemos los defensores de derechos humanos, pero sobre todo los defensores ambientales, quienes en estos años han sido vilmente asesinados. Asesinados por proteger los ecosistemas, asesinados por proteger la vida, no solamente de los pueblos indígenas, de los pueblos de la Amazonía, sino la vida de todo el planeta. Y es increíble ver articulistas en nuestros países que mencionen que la economía está por encima de la vida, por encima de todo lo que nosotros hemos luchado, y que piensen que la extracción de combustibles fósiles sea el camino para resolver la crisis de los países. Eh, acabo de leer un artículo donde decían que aquellos pueblos en aislamiento, que son los pueblos que no están en contacto, no tienen derecho a ocupar espacios territoriales grandes porque son muy pocos, que se les debería reubicarles. Están hablando en esta época de reubicación forzosa. ¿Cómo se ve que los tomadores de decisión en los gobiernos no han entendido exactamente nuestra lucha? Y el acuerdo de Escazú viene a fortalecer ese espacio ese desentendimiento de los mismos gobiernos que firmaron el acuerdo. Y hay que seguir en esta lucha, la lucha de las mujeres que en estos años también han estado en la primera línea de resistencia, la lucha de los pueblos indígenas por la protección de la Amazonía que ha sido nuestra lucha y sobre todo el interés de que este mundo empiece a cambiar de chip, a entender que el modelo económico obsoleto nos está llevando a una crisis global y que eso violenta derechos no solamente de los pueblos indígenas. Yo me atrevo a mencionar que violenta el derecho de vivir en un ambiente sano de todo el mundo y violenta el derecho de seguir subsistiendo. Eso es lo que pasa en nuestros países y hay que recalcarlo con mucha fuerza. Tenemos que seguir luchando. El acuerdo de Escazú es útil porque viene a reforzar todos aquellos puntos con los que hemos luchado y porque señala explícitamente la defensa de los defensores ambientales, el acceso a la libre información y sobre todo que exista justicia, porque en nuestros países no hay justicia, hay corrupción, todo el mundo lo sabe, hay un sistema de gobierno que protege a los que hacen daño, pero no los derechos de los pueblos que estamos vulnerando cada día nuestros derechos y a la cual siguen queriendo ampliar la frontera extractiva y destruyendo los ecosistemas amazónicos. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. Thank you so much, Pat Oop. Thank you so much, Patricia, for your words. And I just have a question before we move to our next speaker for you. You know, um, I wanted just to uh, ask you about you know the role of women land defenders in terms of protecting uh, the Amazon rainforest, and a little bit more detail from you about why it's so important to to understand that we need to protect the defenders who are defending the Amazon. If you could say a little bit more about that so people understand that role. Thank you. En los últimos años, desde el 2013, las mujeres nos hemos aparecido con mucha visibilidad en los medios y en los espacios de opinión pública. Y por eso hemos sido criminalizadas, porque cada vez que alzamos nuestra voz para denunciar los atropellos de los que somos víctimas, nos judicializan a nosotros. Somos víctimas de persecución, de amenazas de muerte. Y realmente las mujeres amazónicas defensoras de la selva han estado al frente denunciando todo tipo de violaciones. Violaciones físicas, violaciones al territorio, violaciones a los derechos de las mujeres. Y eso no les gusta a las empresas y a los gobiernos. 
porque en un estado eh, machista, extractivo, que de alguna manera trata de dominar la voluntad de los pueblos indígenas y sobre todo de las mujeres, que la voz de la mujer se alce, no les gusta. Y, eso, y por eso nos hemos organizado, porque también consideramos que tenemos que expresarnos con nuestra propia voz para denunciar desde el punto de vista y desde nuestros sentimientos. Nosotros como mujeres amazónicas, nuestra lema es todas estamos juntas para defendernos las unas a las otras, pero sobre todo tenemos la misión de proteger los espacios territoriales de los pueblos indígenas. Ya estamos desde el 2013, vamos aglutinando más mujeres, sanándonos también entre mujeres porque vienen de procesos muy dolorosos muchas, pero sobre todo con la firme convicción, convicción de que nuestros espacios territoriales se defienden y que somos cuidadoras de la vida. Eso nos ha valido que nos amenacen de muerte. Nuestros procesos judiciales nunca han llegado a, a dar con los responsables. Recogimos más de 250 mil firmas para presionar al gobierno de Ecuador que hay una adecuada investigación de las amenazas que sufrimos, de la quema de casa, de la pedreada que recibimos en los sitios donde estábamos, pero hasta ahora no ha habido justicia. Entonces, el acceso a la justicia no se da en nuestros países. Hay que seguir presionándolo, hay que seguir insistiendo, porque esa ha sido nuestra forma de lucha. Vamos a continuar luchando como mujeres, continuamos en nuestros espacios, en las comunidades, pero también en espacios de ciudad donde también puedan las otras sociedades, la sociedad civil en su conjunto, escuchar las voces de las mujeres. Thank you so very much, um, Patricia, for your courage and your fight, and know that we um, stand in solidarity with you. And also, this is why we are here having this discussion and advocacy for the Escazú agreement, because uh, without proper implementation, there won't be justice, as you say. So we need to use this lever as much as we can to protect the defenders of the land and the women who are putting their bodies on the line for their communities, but also for all of us in protecting uh, these incredibly biodiverse areas that are critical. So thank you very much for your courage, your advocacy and endurance. And, and we send all good thoughts to you. And with that, um, I welcome uh, Ruth Spencer. She is the deputy chair of Marine Ecosystems Protected Areas Trust uh, from Antigua and Barbuda. And she's on the ground uh, at, the, at the COP. Please go ahead, Ruth, you have the floor, thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone who is joining and participating with us today. The Escazú Agreement represents hope for many of the people and the groups that I work with in Antigua. And like any other convention, it requires a certain amount of pushing engagement to make it possible. And so, because we hope this agreement is gonna give us that voice in environmental decision-making, we are pushing, we are hoping, we are working towards that end. And you know, as I left home, many people have been asking the question, what are you hoping that this first cup is going to do for us? That was the question asked of me yesterday. Somebody else asked again, do you think it's going to work? But I had to say, we have to make it happen. We on the ground have to put processes in place. We have to strengthen our alliances. We have to, streamline the processes. We have to work in unity to make things happen. Because in our small islands, the protection of the ecosystems is very, very important to our survival. We, our location puts us at risk from hurricanes, natural disasters, and a lot of our people live along the coastlines. So when you hear natural disasters come in, we depend on those natural ecosystems, these mangroves, these wetlands, to provide a large degree of protection from these storms. But development 
does not fit in with how the natural ecosystems are to work because when we have development, a lot of the investors don't see that vision of protection for us. And many times these protections are destroyed. So of course, people are gonna send out an alarm when they see something wrong happening in the community, when there's machines that are pushing down the trees. We know the value of trees. When we have sprays being sprayed on plants for fogging, that are killing our pollinators, which are so vital for agriculture. So people know there's a certain amount of, of enforcement that is not taking place. We have laws to protect the forest. We have laws to protect our health, laws to protect the people. But many times these are not enforced. And so people send out an alarm, they send out a signal, they send out an email, something is happening that isn't right. And I am expected to take a role to contact somebody and I normally do that. But what we are saying now with the Eskazo agreement, our voices, we have been left out of decision-making. As Judge Rita Oligati told me last week in Grenada, why is development like state secrets? Sometimes if somebody doesn't leak a piece of information, you don't know what's going on. And these very forms of development many times bring harm to people and the environment. And so the role of our local groups, the role of our women, as they seek to protect the environment and to protect our communities, is to inform, is to share local knowledge, is to share the observations that we have to take action. And so our environmental defenders all over the world, those in Latin America, those in the Caribbean, I want to salute them because they put their life at risk just to protect us. The systems that give us air, that give us water, the soils that grow feed, food. These are the things they're protecting. They're protecting our lives, our environment. And so the Eskazo Agreement, we have to make it work for us. We have to push at the local level to ensure that our voices are heard. And because of this, we need to build cooperations. We need to build alliances. We need to network. We need to grow in areas of environmental governance. There are capacities, new capacities that need to be built, but by cooperation and partnerships, we can put new processes into effect that will help us to safeguard our environment and our future and have development in a more conducted in a more sustainable pattern. This is the only way forward. And we, as the local community people, we as the women defenders, we have to hold governments accountable because these agreements have been signed, but not enforced. And so our role going forward is very clear. Here at the COP, we expect that our voices, all the processes, the procedures that are going to be put in place will give us that power, that strength, that, ad, that determination to advocate more. And so I salute everybody. Let's continue to work together. Let's build our alliances so that we can protect people and the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth, for your incredible advocacy, your powerful voice, and for being on the ground to do the work that needs to be done and thank you for your leadership. We deeply appreciate your time and you being here with us and all the work you've done. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to hand the floor to Patricia Madrigal Cordero. She is an environmental lawyer, the former vice minister of environment and energy from Costa Rica. And she is also on the ground at the COP. Welcome, Patricia, you have the floor. Muy buenas tardes y muchas gracias por la invitación de compartir 
Primero con este panel de mujeres excelentes, luchadoras, defensoras de los derechos humanos y defensores del, del ambiente también. Eh, yo voy a hacer mi presentación en español, pero las diapositivas están en inglés para aquellas personas que nos acompañan y que su lengua primaria es el inglés. Y aunque confío plenamente en la traducción, pues tener también este, la diferencia con, con quienes me participan en este eh, evento paralelo. Pues muchas gracias a Women's Earth and Climate Action Network International y a Reacción Climática por organizar este evento paralelo en este momento justamente histórico que está por iniciar la primera conferencia a las partes del Acuerdo de Escazú. Y como ustedes eh, saben, eh, el Acuerdo de Escazú es la forma corta en que nos referimos a este acuerdo regional sobre el acceso a la información, la participación pública y la justicia en materia ambiental para América Latina y el Caribe. Y tenemos, no se escucha. Uh -huh. A ver, ¿se escucha ahora? Gracias. Eh, tenemos tres temas para, para dialogar durante estos días acá en la sede de la CEPAL en Santiago de Chile. Tres temas muy importantes. Primero, las modalidades de participación del público. Next slide, please. Eh, segundo, no es, creo que estamos un poquito adelante. We, we are a little bit ahead. Can we go back, please? One more. Okay, okay, we, we can stay there. Thank you. Eh, las reglas de composición y funcionamiento del Comité de Apoyo para la Aplicación y el, el Cumplimiento y el Fondo de Contribuciones este, Voluntarias. Y hay, hay, en estos documentos hay temas que nos interesan, muy importantes, para garantizar los derechos de las mujeres y la equidad de género. Ahora sí, next slide, please. Y recordemos que un cuarto pilar del Acuerdo de Escazú tiene que ver con el reconocimiento y la necesidad de que los estados garanticen el entorno seguro y propicio de los defensores de los derechos humanos en asuntos ambientales. Aquí hay tres elementos que incluye el artículo 9 del Acuerdo de Escazú. En primer lugar, la obligación de garantizar un entorno seguro y propicio, sin amenazas, restricciones o inseguridad, en segundo lugar, establecer las medidas adecuadas y efectivas para reconocer, proteger y promover todos los derechos humanos en general. Y en tercer lugar, el establecimiento de medidas apropiadas, efectivas y oportunas para prevenir, investigar y sancionar aquellos ataques, amenazas o intimidaciones a los defensores de derechos humanos en asuntos ambientales. Pero aquí pueden suceder varias cosas. Next, please. Next slide. La primera tiene que ver con la prevención y la investigación de los ataques, esas amenazas o intimidaciones a los defensores de derechos humanos que pueden sufrir en el ejercicio de los derechos. Este es el, la primera, el primer elemento más importante. ¿Qué me dice mamá? Sorry, I have two guests here. <laughs> Tengo dos perritos aquí que me acompañan. Next slide, please. Y la segunda tiene que ver 
en cómo se utiliza el sistema para criminalizar esos defensoras y defensores del ambiente. En lugar de protegerlos, usar el sistema para acusarlos, deslegitimar, elaborar campañas de desprestigio, obstaculizar, impedir su trabajo. Y aquí hay dos elementos también, que es aplicar mal el derecho penal o castigar o obstaculizar la actividad legal y legítima. Y este tema de criminalizar los defensores en derechos humanos en asuntos ambientales tiene mucho que ver con el tema de las mujeres porque la primera herramienta que se utiliza para deslegitimar esa lucha que se realiza desde los colectivos y las individualidades de las mujeres. Next slide. Tenemos agresiones que, se, que reciben las lideresas de las que me acompañan en este panel también por razones de género. Son agredidas por, ese, por, esa, por esa defensa de los derechos humanos, por esa defensa del ambiente y porque son parte de movimientos sociales desde donde reciben amenazas por oponerse a proyectos de empresas extractivas y enfrentan amenazas por razones de género, incluyendo la violencia sexual. Y esos retos no solo luchan por sus territorios y recursos naturales, por sus comunidades y familias, sino que a la misma vez el, el, el enfrentar las necesidades económicas, emocionales y productivas de acuerdo a ello. Next slide, please. Lo paradójico de esta situación es que muchas veces esta participación de las mujeres en la toma de decisiones al interior de sus comunidades y en los procesos de consulta o negociación a nivel nacional no se da de la mejor manera. Y esto podemos verlo por múltiples factores como los roles tradicionales, la relegación de la mujer a papeles secundarios en asuntos públicos, la falta de acceso a la información, a la comunicación, así como a la carencia de su reconocimiento como propietarias de la tierra. Por eso es muy importante incorporar los enfoques de género e interculturalidad en los instrumentos de gestión ambiental que se traduzcan en estrategias, metodologías y acciones para lograr esa participación efectiva de las mujeres que lo establece el Acuerdo de Escazú en esa evaluación de impactos, de, de impactos ambientales, fiscalización ambiental, monitoreo y verificación. Hay que entender que garantizar los derechos de acceso, estos derechos de acceso a la información, a la participación y a la justicia, es un elemento fundamental para el empoderamiento de las mujeres y para avanzar en la equidad de género. Next, please. Para ir terminando estos eh, breves comentarios, vamos a discutir en los documentos y en los temas que les planteé anteriormente. En primer lugar, en las reglas de procedimiento, que la mesa directiva esté integrada por uno de los representantes electos del público que pueda establecer ese enlace con los países que la, que la integrarán, que serán cinco, aunque con voz, pero sin voto. En la estructura de los órganos eh, subsidiarios que establezcan las conferencias de las partes, a que los nombramientos y las elecciones se hagan siempre considerando el enfoque de género. Y en tercer lugar, el uso de la palabra. El uso de la palabra otorgado por la presidencia según el orden de su solicitud que incluya también al público con el objetivo de que cada uno sea escuchado. Next. En lo que se refiere bueno, en lo que se refiere al Comité de Apoyo para la Aplicación y el Cumplimiento del Acuerdo de Escazú, en esa composición de siete miembros se debe considerar la paridad de género. En las funciones se establece que se pueden elaborar informes específicos sobre la aplicación y el cumplimiento del acuerdo de Escazú, como lo podría ser 
el tema efectivamente del de enfoque de género. En cuanto a las comunicaciones, la posibilidad de ser presentados por partes del público y también de participar en las funciones de ese comité, presentando información, asistiendo a las sesiones que deben ser públicas. El Acuerdo de Escazú, además de ser una herramienta legal, se ha convertido en un movimiento para promover la participación de abajo hacia arriba. Ya lo decían las compañeras que me antecedieron en el, en el uso de la palabra, que el rol de la mujer aquí es crucial en las organizaciones y colectivos para promover los cambios progresivos en la sociedad. Y si quienes están con nosotros no se han inscrito todavía en el mecanismo público regional, hágalo y sea parte de este movimiento. Este movimiento que por un lado tiene la parte de negociación y de diplomacia y por otro lado también tiene muy asentadas sus raíces en el día a día y en la acción de la defensa de los derechos humanos y de los derechos ambientales. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia, for that wonderful presentation and also really clarifying the process that is actually going on during uh, the COP in Chile. It's really helpful to see that and for also really uplifting specifically in more detail the gender role and the role of women's leadership. So thank you very much and thank you for your advocacy these days in Chile. We really appreciate you being on our steering committee and, and for your expertise all these years. Thank you. And with that, um, I'm very honored to now introduce Sonia Bonje Guajajara. Uh, she is an indigenous leader from Brazil, from the Guajajara people. She's the executive coordinator for the Articulation of Indigenous Peoples of Brazil, a PEEP. And we're really honored to have uh, Sonia with us today um, in this historic moment of uh, the Ascazu Agreement. And, and uh, one of the most powerful leaders I know uh, um, in Brazil, really putting her body on the line, fighting for <laughs> community, fighting for indigenous rights, and, and fighting for the Amazon. So with that, please take the floor, Sonia. Thank you. Olá, boa tarde. Olá, Osprey. Boa tarde. Demais companheiras que estão compondo este painel. Né? Muito obrigada pelo convite de estar junto aqui, falando nesse, nesse, nesse evento né, de pré-COP do Acordo de Escazú. Hoje, 19 de abril, é o dia de resistência dos povos indígenas. Estamos aqui né, hoje nessa luta constantemente contra toda a violação dos direitos, contra todo esse pacote de destruição colocado contra os povos indígenas aqui no, no Brasil. O Acordo de Escazu é uma, é uma iniciativa muito importante para garantir essa participação né, pública dos povos indígenas também. Infelizmente, o Brasil não ratificou o acordo, né, o que é lamentável no momento que nós estamos precisando muito dessa garantia de direitos nacional e internacional. Então, nós recorremos à comunidade internacional para estar junto com a gente, apoiando né, as nossas mobilizações. Acabamos de realizar o 18º Acampamento Terra Livre. Muitos de vocês acompanharam. Né? O acampamento reuniu mais de 8 mil indígenas aqui no Brasil, com a presença de crianças, jovens, mulheres, anciãos, anciãs. Né, e que já é considerada a maior assembleia dos povos indígenas do Brasil e também já reconhecida como a maior mobilização indígena do mundo. Nós queremos transformar essa mobilização, de fato, numa mobilização internacional, onde todas vocês possam vir participar com a gente, para que a gente possa fazer com que os direitos dos povos indígenas sejam implementados em todo o mundo. Precisamos muito desse apoio para que o Acordo de Escazu, mesmo não sendo ratificado pelo Brasil, possa, sim, ser efetivado de forma que venha coibir 
né, toda essa ausência da participação indígena nos espaços de tomada de decisão. Precisamos nos juntar para sensibilizar o mundo, para conscientizar sobre a importância, né, sobre a urgência de se mudar o modelo econômico. Não podemos mais permitir o um modelo econômico baseado na exploração predatória dos territórios. E quando eu falo territórios, eu estou falando né, da, da floresta, das águas, dos mares e oceanos, que são territórios, são corpos, né? e que todos dependem desses territórios protegidos para a gente continuar defendendo o nosso planeta e a nossa vida. Portanto, né, é, nós nos juntamos nos juntamos a essa luta né, pela implementação desse importante acordo né, nos países que estão ratificados, mas que também o efeito, né, mesmo sendo um acordo internacional e o Brasil não assinou, mas que o efeito possa também repercutir internamente aqui no Brasil. Né, temos aí essa luta permanente contra as grandes mineradoras que insistem em adentrar aos territórios indígenas que insistem em explorar de forma predatória né, nossos territórios, trazendo grandes consequências como aumento de doenças, conflitos, violências, é, é, alcoolismo, prostituição, né, o que altera significativamente os nossos modos de vida. Lutamos também contra essa expansão do agronegócio que desenfreadamente, sem respeitar o direito de consulta livre, prévia e informada, né, vem adentrando aos territórios por meio das monoculturas que só destroem, empobrecem nosso solo e acabam diminuindo né, a, a produção da diversidade de alimentos o que de verdade a gente consome como alimento. Né? Então, temos essa grande preocupação contra essa expansão agrícola que vem cada vez mais expulsando pessoas e negando a demarcação dos nossos territórios. Né? Temos uma luta também incessante contra a exploração ilegal de madeira, que muito violenta os nossos territórios e violenta também as pessoas, e que tem provocado muitas mortes. Né? O Brasil segue sempre entre o primeiro ao terceiro país que, mais, é, que é mais perigoso para defensores e defensoras dos direitos humanos. Né? Então, nós precisamos sair dessa marginalidade, precisamos... Né, lutar por um direito que, de fato, é, venha, venha garantir a segurança dos guardiões, das guardiões de quem realmente está no dia a dia né, fazendo essa luta para proteger a biodiversidade. E nós, povos indígenas, lutamos não apenas por direitos, né, lutamos pelo nosso modo de vida, lutamos pelo nosso direito de existir. Então, eu agradeço muito né, pelo espaço, a oportunidade de estar aqui com vocês, me somo a toda essa luta e convido também para que possam estar junto com, conosco, povos indígenas no Brasil, em junho, em mais uma grande mobilização, onde vamos fazer né, o nosso enfrentamento contra a aprovação do marco temporal que é essa lei que está aí em pauta no Supremo Tribunal Federal, que pretende delimitar o tempo para reconhecimento dos territórios indígenas e que nega né, o direito tradicional, a ocupação tradicional de nossos povos. Então, muito obrigada, gente, um grande abraço e seguimos juntos, que essa luta é nossa. Thank you so much, Sonia, for joining us and taking time with us and for your outstanding leadership um, and, and all the work you do for so many years. 
And just for everyone who's joined us, we are putting links, as you see in the chat, to all of these women leaders and the efforts that they are leading. So keep looking in the chat to the links for all of their organizations, for the efforts that they are uh, working on. And you can and click on those links and learn more about each of these women presenters and the incredible work that they're discussing and find ways to support them. And Sonia, just for you to know, as always, we stand with you. We will continue to be with you in your struggle. And thank you for your incredible courage and leadership. Um, and it's such a celebration to, to hear. And we had uh, one of our team members on the ground for the, the camp last week, 8,000 indigenous leaders, incredible uh, inspiration for the entire world. Um, and, and again, just to highlight that, you know, it's the indigenous peoples of Brazil that are protecting the Amazon rainforest that all of us depend on for life, for water, for air, for biodiversity. And we thank you for, for protecting your own communities, but for, for all of us, thank you very, very much. And uh, we will continue to, to, to stand with you. And with that, I would like to hand the floor to Helena Balinga. She is uh, Kishwa from Ecuador. She's a climate and indigenous rights youth activist from Sariaco. And we are honored also to have her as a weekend youth leader. And you now have the floor, Helena. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Asprey. Um, thank you for having in the space with all the amazing women that spoke before me. Um, for, and thank, thank you for giving me the space to speak about the, the SCSI agreement and why it's so important um, for environmental defenders, for indigenous leaders, uh, for young people, for women, and for the Amazon, which is my home. Um, I come from an indigenous community called Sarayaku in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, uh, from the same community as Patricia Walinga, uh, and we have a long history of fighting the oil industry and extractivism. Um, and this is why it is so important to us that this agreement is implemented um, in, in our countries. Um, the Escazú Agreement is a way for us to make sure that free prior and informed consent is actually fulfilled. Um, right now, a mining and oil expansion is expected in Ecuador um, and specifically in the Amazon. Um, we have about two oil spills per week in the Ecuador and Amazon and mining is bringing extreme pollution to our water systems, which means that indigenous people are um, both polluted with the oil spills and the um, pollution from, from mining and from uh, mine extraction. Um, so make, making sure that free prior and informed consent is fulfilled is a at most important um, so that indigenous people are the ones to actually decide over our own territories. Um, la the last few years have been one of the deadliest ones for indigenous people and indigenous land defenders uh, and environmental defenders. Um, and that some countries uh, do not want to and are refusing to sign it only shows how they are treating uh, indigenous people and land defenders in their own countries. It's a refusal of protecting indigenous people and protecting land defenders. Um, and this is a way for them to continue extracting um, the resources from our territories. Um, the, as the agreement is a binding one, it does scare them because uh, once it's signed, they cannot continue doing harm and they cannot continue violating our rights. Um, and for me as a young person, as a woman, um, it is also a, a defense mechanism for us because if you're not already on the front line, you eventually will. Um, and when you are at the front line, that's when you're facing all these powers. Um, so for us, it's, it's really, really important that the Eskisu Agreement is, is implemented um, and that all countries in Latin America and in the, in the Caribbean actually sign on to it. Um, and as we speak, uh, we've just received uh, the, the new IPCC report and, um, you know, we've seen the, the devastating report and 
and um, what is waiting basically if there is no action taken. And even though we've seen this and we've had scientific proof um, and of, of how climate change is only getting worse and worse, um, our countries still are exploiting the Amazon and our ecosystems, harming biodiversity um, and even killing people. Um, and, and there is still no action. So for us to be able to fight climate change and to do it from our own countries by, for example, for us defending the Amazon, which is how we contribute to this, um, it is of, of, of extreme importance that this agreement is signed on to. Um, and it's been really incredible to see that a lot of young people have been leading um, the, uh, the advocacy for their governments uh, to sign on to this. And I think it also shows um, that the, the youth involvement and engagement shows um, our, uh, how desperate we are to, to, um, to protect our planet and to protect our future. Um, and, and is why we've been so involved in this process. Um, that is all for me. Thank you all for, for listening and, and for having me here. Thank you so much, Helena, for your powerful words and also for uh, really being such an incredible voice for young women and youth and always standing for the young people and reminding us to uh, understand uh, even at a deeper level, the emergency that we're in for uh, young people and uh, you know what your future holds. And I know that you carry that in a very deep way. So thank you for your leadership in joining us. Uh, we really appreciate that. And for joining our steering committee in this fight for the Escazo Agreement to be implemented and implemented in an effective way. Um, and with that, I'm really honored to now introduce Paloma Costa Oliveira. She is the member of the United Nations Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group. So again, lifting up the voice of the youth and I hand the floor now to you, Paloma. Thank you for joining us. Obrigada, gente, pelo convite. É, eu me chamo Paloma Costa, eu sou uma das sete jovens conselheiras do secretário-geral da ONU, também sou assessora jurídica do Instituto Socioambiental é, e trabalho aqui no Brasil com diferentes movimentos, grupos. E, bem, eu acho que as palestrantes que vieram antes de mim é, já falaram bastante sobre como está esse acordo, em que ponto nós estamos. Acho que a Soninha mesma colocou né, a dificuldade que a gente tem aqui no Brasil pelo fato do nosso país ainda ser um dos países aqui na América Latina que não aceitou a implementação desse acordo. E isso, sem dúvida alguma, é, impacta diretamente as nossas vidas como defensoras socioambientais, como mulheres, como juventudes, como mulheres indígenas, como esses grupos que estão marginalizados dos, dos debates, dos espaços de tomada de decisão. É, uma reflexão que eu fiz é, sobre esse tema, né, e que foi algo que a gente já compartilhou nesse espaço, é sobre a importância, por exemplo, do acesso à informação para garantia de uma participação efetiva e democrática. Não existe... É, a gente poder ocupar esses espaços de tomada de decisão sem o acesso à informação, sem uma educação de qualidade que nos possibilite entender essas informações e sem, claro, esses espaços para participar. E o Acordo de Escazu, é, conforme já foi comentado por essas grandes mulheres que falaram antes de mim, possibilita que a gente tenha espaço para isso, que a gente tenha acesso à informação que a gente possa se pronunciar com segurança, porque isso é uma realidade para a gente aqui na América Latina. Quando a gente levanta a nossa voz e nós, mulheres, que estamos tomando frente, a gente é agredida, a gente tem que enfrentar uma série de fake news, a gente tem que enfrentar ainda um colonialismo, um patriarcalismo que não deixa que as nossas vozes sejam, de fato, escutadas. Mesmo a gente sabendo que somos nós, mulheres, que estamos nesse fronte, nessa frente. Que nem a Helena falou, é, a agenda de clima, os últimos relatórios do IPCC, que é esse painel científico, foram diretamente muito enfáticos. A gente não tem mais 10 anos, 
para ficar pensando em política climática. A América do Sul, o continente onde eu vivo, vai ser uma das regiões mais impactadas pela crise do clima. E aqui, as pessoas na minha região vão ter cinco vezes mais chances de morrer. Pensando que mulheres são as mais afetadas, enfrentando diretamente os impactos do clima. Quem que vai restar na nossa região, no nosso país, se a gente não começar a garantir esses espaços, a garantir mais mulheres na, na política? Esse ano eu estou com muita esperança aqui, no, aqui quanto ao Brasil, porque a gente vai ter a oportunidade de eleger candidatas como a Soninha Guajajara, que vai sair como deputada e espero que ocupe o Congresso Nacional e tantas outras mulheres. Que nem a Soninha estava comentando, no ATL foram lançadas mais de 30 candidaturas, sendo que a maioria é de mulheres que vão estar no front, que vão estar enfrentando isso na política. E é isso que eu quero ver, é isso que assinar esse acordo e fazer parte dessa rede nacional significa a gente garantir espaços de segurança para a discussão democrática. O último relatório do IPCC também traz um dado muito importante para as juventudes. Dizem que nós, como jovens, teremos 15 vezes mais chances de sofrer com os impactos das mudanças do clima. E se a gente, como jovem, já está sofrendo de uma imensa ansiedade climática, trabalhando, estudando, sendo ativista, estando nesses diferentes espaços, que juventude, que saúde mental, que qualidade de vida que a gente vai ter no futuro. Então, eu espero, sim, que as estruturas possam mudar, possam garantir esses espaços de debate, possam proteger as nossas vozes, dar segurança, dar oportunidade. Não dá para ficar trabalhando se sentindo ameaçado, com medo, sempre num... num num senso de reação, de luta, de estar sempre ali em guerra. Eu sei que isso é o que muitos grupos enfrentam há anos, mas a gente tem que mudar essa realidade. A gente tem que, de fato, começar a reflorestar as nossas estruturas, a mudar a forma como a gente se entende e se trata como sociedade. E, sem dúvidas algumas, o Acordo de Escazu é, ele possibilita que a gente mude as estruturas, que já são totalmente insustentáveis. E, é, que nem eu falava, é, além da participação é, democrática garantida pelo acordo, eu acho que também é uma oportunidade da gente formar na perenidade, né, para esse futuro, uma consciência coletiva do que, que a gente quer para a nossa região. Não adianta mais a gente pensar em políticas é, ambientais separadas do sócio. Não dá mais para a gente pensar que, que tratar de justiça climática, tratar de meio ambiente, é, é desassociado de falar de seres humanos. A gente só muda a realidade do clima quando a gente investe em pessoas, quando a gente investe em estruturas e espaços seguros para que a gente possa enfrentar esse que é o maior desafio da humanidade. Aqui na América Latina, a gente tem feito um processo enorme de trazer uma democracia para as nossas realidades, de mudar os governos, de mudar, é, de fato, quem está ocupando esses lugares de espaço de tomada de decisão, mas a gente precisa se unir para se comprometer a uma política que não seja para hoje, para dois anos de políticas de estados, mas sim que seja uma política nacional, um plano de perenidade para a nossa região. Não existem fronteiras aqui na América Latina, no mundo. Nós somos a grande pátria e a gente precisa se articular junto. Então, eu espero que países como o meu, como o Brasil, realmente se comprometam, se insiram nessa aliança com uma vontade mesmo de mudar da gente construir junto uma estrutura, uma rede que seja forte e tenha capacidade de falar e de pensar juntos o que, é que a gente quer para o nosso território sul-americano, latino-americano. Obrigada. Thank you so very much, uh, Paloma, for your incredible advocacy and your dedication and uh, your, your strength in uh, also leading the youth voice as well. And, and reminding us again how much also there's an intersection of uh, the role of democracy and, and how that relates to ensuring different policies are 
uplifted in country. So thank you for your, your work in many, many different arenas. And again, pointing out you know, the, the IPCC reports and others where scientists and indigenous peoples both are really um, letting us know the depth of the crisis we're in and what we need to do now and take action. And I just wanted to highlight before I hand it to our esteemed final speaker, Carmen Caprillas, that um, I want to post again for people in the chat the uh, launch of our new website today, where we're looking country by country and have gone to law firms country by country to interpret what are the best intersections between country laws and the Escazu Agreement so they can be very, very specific about what is actually possible when you look at each country and how best to implement the Escazu Agreement. And we're really excited to be able to share that with everyone so that there's more opportunities for clarity about implementation uh, specific to region. And with that, I welcome Carmen Caprillas. She is the founder of Reaction Climatica. She's also on the ground uh, with, um, uh, in Chile right now for the COP. And we're very honored that she is Weekend's coordinator for the Latin American region. Uh, she lives in Bolivia, but is now uh, zooming in to us from Chile. Welcome. You have the floor, Carmen. Eh, muchas gracias a todos. Eh, muy buenas tardes. Un saludo aquí desde Chile. Eh, bueno, como ya hemos escuchado a nuestras compañeras, estamos viendo que el tema de género no tiene que ser un tema que se pase de la largo, especialmente en la región latinoamericana, donde eh, sabemos que el estatus de la mujer todavía no ha logrado eh, un tema de igualdad. Estamos enfrentándonos constantemente contra todos los retos de gobiernos que están implementando les, eh, el extractivismo en toda la región, a quienes poco o nada les importa lo que tengan que decir este, las personas que viven en el lugar. Y es en ese sentido que estamos pro, promoviendo el trabajo eh, en relación al acuerdo de Escazú, porque nos parece importante que estas voces no se callen, porque nos parece importante que se consulte tanto a pueblos indígenas como a comunidades locales sobre qué es lo que queremos, cuál queremos que sea el futuro de los recursos naturales. Y también es importante identificar quiénes van a ser los beneficiarios. Creo que hay que cambiar todos estos esquemas extractivistas que los hemos heredado desde la colonia y que actualmente siguen funcionando. Ya no... Eh, yendo a España, al Vaticano, como era hace 500 años, pero eh, ahora tenemos al capitalismo que su oferta y su demanda está haciendo que ciertos, eh, ciertos mercados eh, impulsen a las poblaciones latinos, a las poblaciones de Latinoamérica a entrar en este tipo de actividades como son la minería, como son eh, el tema de mercados de tierras que involucran la deforestación y la ampliación de la frontera agrícola. Necesitamos un cambio de chip, como dijo Patricia, eh, eh, en relación a lo que queremos en la región y tenemos que dar un prácticas que sean mucho más amigables con el medio ambiente y no simplemente que se encarguen de extraer los recursos naturales y de dejarnos este, lo que es la pobreza, de dejarnos las, las comunidades partidas, de dejarnos un tejido social este, roto, sino que necesitamos lo contrario, un desarrollo que tome en cuenta las voces de los que están abajo. Necesitamos un desarrollo sostenible que se preocupe de, de eh, el futuro de estos, eh, de estos eh, recursos naturales, pero que no nos tenga que hacer elegir entre lo que es nuestro derecho al desarrollo o nuestro derecho a un eh, medio ambiente sano, sino que tenemos que repensar cómo es que vamos a ir avanzando como región latinoamericana. Basta de asesinatos a líderes indígenas o a líderes ambientales o a líder, líderes sociales o en especial a mujeres. Muchos 
de los asesinatos a mujeres no son visualizados debido a que no tienen tanta palestra como el tema de los hombres. Y esa es una cultura que queremos cambiar poco a poco y es un tema que, va, va, que lo vamos a trabajar junto con la bandera de la COP, de, del Acuerdo de Escazú, con las comunidades, con los pueblos indígenas, con las bases, para que realmente exista este tipo de cambio aquí en América Latina. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Carmen, and thank you for your advocacy um, and doing the work on the ground. We really appreciate you being in Chile at this time. And I'd like to go ahead and open up the floor for discussion and questions. And maybe the panelists could turn their videos back on so we can all see each other. That would be really wonderful if you can, if you're able to, to, to have your video on. And we want to go ahead and open up the floor uh, in the few minutes that we have left here for any of the participants um, who have joined us. We're so glad everyone could join us. Um, if we could go ahead and open up the floor for questions, um, that would be really great um, since we have this esteemed group of panelists uh, with us. And um, I'll look for the questions in the chat, um, please, Please uh, go ahead and do that now. And while we're, we're uh, encouraging people to ask questions who've, who've joined us, uh, you sent a question a minute ago, here it is. Um, maybe Catherine, you could help me a little bit with locating that question. Do you see the question, Catherine? Okay, here's a question, thank you. From Stevie, do you think the UN, um, do you think that the United Nations SDGs are a good way to move forward with implementing systemic change? I'm curious because when I look at the SDGs, I know that none of those targets will be met if we are existing under our current structure. Do you think within advocating and implementing the SDGs, we will create the system change to happen? This is a question um, we, we often get asked, and I wonder if any of the panelists uh, want to answer that. Just, you know, as always, you know, is the United Nations systems working? Are the SDGs working? Are they going to get us the change that we need, given every element of emergency that has been discussed uh, in this panel? Uh, would one of the panelists like to address that? Carmen, do you want to jump in on that? I know that's an area you've worked in. Others are welcome as well. Well, go ahead, uh, Patricia. See you, Patricia. Patricia, would you like to weigh in on that? Go ahead, Pat Patricia. Sí. Um, Vamos a ver, yo creo que esa pregunta es muy interesante porque es una pregunta eh, como del, de, del derecho internacional en general. Y si lo vemos en un momento específico, quizás pensemos que no. Pero hay que verlo como parte de un proceso. Cuando se adoptaron los objetivos para el desarrollo sostenible, veníamos de otra serie de objetivos que pues no se cumplieron de la mejor manera, este, que eran sectoriales y, y avanzamos a tener una visión un poquito más integral. De hecho, el Acuerdo Escazú está alineado con el Objetivo 16 para tener sociedades pacíficas y justas que habla del fortalecimiento del Estado de Derecho. Pero estos son objetivos aspiracionales. Yo creo que ningún estado en este momento puede decir que tiene un estado de derecho totalmente fortalecido, porque es un objetivo que se va eh, desarrollando en el, en el tiempo. Podemos acercarnos un poco a su cumplimiento y todavía vamos a ver como el horizonte, algo hacia dónde eh, caminar. Entonces, eh, 
creo que este marco de objetivos internacionales y de acuerdos internacionales nos dan herramientas para poder avanzar, pero también necesitamos ese contacto con la práctica, con el ejercicio que nos permita garantizar esos derechos y no se queden ahí uh, arriba sin, sin poder eh, concretarse. Thank you so much, Patricia. We appreciate that response. I'm going to share with the panelists a couple of questions and, and people can um, respond uh, from the panel as they wish. I'm going to sort of summarize two questions. One of the questions is around how can the Escazu agreement have a gender and feminist perspective? Is there a way to ensure that the Escazu agreement um, really has a vision of gender justice and a feminist lens. It would be great if one or two of you could answer that. And then there's another question, which is that, you know, in terms of where the Escaz agreement is, you know, it, it's, um, you know, a big step away from, you know, all the things that we need. And so, you know, what is it that um, different NGOs from wherever they are, whether from the LAC region or elsewhere, um, you know, how can their people support, you know, how can there be more advocacy uh, for this agreement? Um, how do we really push, as an example, those who have not signed, countries that have not signed, to get them to sign? So what are some of the things NGOs can do to, to help advocate for the Escazo agreement and its implementation? So there's really two questions. One is around the gender and feminist lens of the agreement and how that can be uplifted. And then second one is for, you know, NGOs, others, activists, how can they get involved in helping to push this agenda forward of the Escazo Agreement? So I'll look to, to the panelists now to um, see who would like to respond. Maybe you could just indicate with your hand up. Uh, okay, Ruth, go ahead, please, you have the floor. Escazo, like any other convention, requires that commitment. So what I do, whatever work I am doing with groups in the communities, I always have the gender lens. So I'm listening, I want to function in inclusive and participatory processes. So I want everybody to give their ideas. I ever want everybody to give their solutions. So it's how we operate locally. Do we have that philosophy? Do we have that mindset that when we are working with people, we encourage them to share, to give their voices? It's something that has, be, has to become part of our lifestyle, where people matter, the ideas of people matter, and we have to live that lifestyle live that lifestyle, show people that we respect them, that, that their ideas are important. And we are for real, we are willing to go that extra mile to ensure that their needs, that their desires, that their ideas mean a lot and can be implemented. We have to take on different roles and responsibilities. I do not like to be working in isolated and in a boxed form. If the challenge requires me to wear a different hat, to do something different, I'm willing to take that risk on behalf of people. So it's basically our lifestyle and what we portray to people. We are moving more to a people-centered development. So everything we do must include the ideas and bring solutions to people. And when people see that we respect them, we tr they trust us and that opens more doors for development. We have to function as links, as bridges between the policymakers and the local people. So whatever situation we are in, we have to deliver for the people. That's what ESCASO requires new commitments, new determinations, new forms of advocacy, building new alliances to reach to these goals. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Is there anyone else from the panel that would like to 
uh, respond to that question of either um, the, the gender and feminist lens or how other groups can help this Gaza agreement move forward? Any other panelists want to weigh in on that? Go ahead, Carmen. Sí, gracias, Osprey. Eh, primeramente, lo que tenemos que hacer es visualizar estas luchas que están ocurriendo en los territorios. Eh, y como mencioné hace un rato, invisibilizamos mucho el rol de la mujer en todo lo que es América Latina. Eh, a pesar de que se ha logrado un, eh, una mayor participación de mujeres en muchos espacios, eh, tanto de poder, tanto políticos como productivos, como económicos, en diferentes roles, eh, todavía nos falta mucho. Tenemos una brecha muy grande entre hombres y, y mujeres en la región latinoamericana y muchas veces tendemos a invisibilizar estas luchas, invisibilizar estos roles, invisibilizar este trabajo que las mujeres están haciendo en toda la región. Y lo primero que hay que hacer es empezar a, a, a visualizar qué es lo que está pasando. Y más aún en el tema de defensores, porque cuando una mujer se opone pone a un tipo de proyecto o megaproyecto o está ahí en, luchando en, eh, en, en, en los territorios, lo primero que va a escuchar es que la llaman loca, eh, el, término, el tema del desprestigio, el tema de que es una madre, mala madre, el tema de que tiene que hacerse cargo primero de su casa, etcétera, etcétera, y va por una serie de, esto es lo más suave, ¿no? Va escalando, 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 hasta que... Eh, eh, su acción se ve realmente interesante. Persona amenazas a su familia y en ese sentido no puede desarrollar e eh, ir más allá sus actividades y termina retirándose. Y eso es un problema que lo hemos visto en muchas áreas y creemos que eso hay que cambiar. Tenemos que garantizar los derechos de los defensores ambientales, pero también de las defensoras ambientales y entender sus luchas y entender sus visiones. Porque las mujeres son las que están más ligadas con los temas de biodiversidad, más ligadas con los temas del campo. En Bolivia, en, en Latinoamérica hemos sufrido una, sufrimos, bueno, no sufrimos, no es la palabra correcta, pero estamos viendo un fenómeno de feminización del área rural y eso tenemos que estar conscientes de que las mujeres se están quedando en los territorios, en las comunidades, mientras los hombres migran tanto a las ciudades como al norte. Y eso nos tiene que, tiene que ser un hilo conductor que nos una a las mujeres latinoamericanas a enfrentar esta lucha por los recursos naturales. Nuevos paradigmas de desarrollo. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Carmen. Really appreciate that. And just to add, you know, in terms of groups getting involved, uh, we've put a link in the chat to the campaign and everyone is welcome to join. Um, it, of course, it first and foremost is for women in the LAC region um, and the advocacy there. And number one, for supporting the frontline women defenders in the LAC region. But it is also a campaign for the world because we can also apply as Sonia Guajajara was saying, international pressure on governments to, to sign the agreement and to implement it in a strong way because we're all interconnected. Their borders are only political boundaries. We are all connected. We are all uh, human beings, uh, sisters connected together around the world, uh, fighting for a collective future. So we can all work to support uh, this agreement and, and Again, we would just suggest um, reaching out to the various campaigns that are going on right now for this really incredible multilateral agreement. And also for indigenous uh, people who are on the call, not from Latin America or Caribbean region. You know, the thing is, if this is successful, this should be something that is implemented around the world. So I think we should use this as a lever for um, implementation and expansion of this agreement to many, many different regions because it gives a foothold for both environmental and human rights protection. And as Helena Golinga said, you know, another foothold into free prior and informed consent for indigenous peoples. 
Uh, we're coming up to the top of the, the session. And so uh, what I'd like to do is to just do a quick kind of lightning round and let all of the presenters just have a closing comment for maybe a minute or two, and then we'll close out. So uh, we'll just give everybody a, some, a way to, to have any final thoughts or comments they have. Um, and so we're gonna go around from Patricia, then to Ruth, then to Patricia Madrigal Cordero, then to Sonia, and then Hel Helena, Paloma, and Carmen, just to give you all the final word. So let's go ahead and, and hear from Patricia Galinga. Any final thoughts before we close uh, the panel? Thank you. You have the floor, Patricia. Gracias. Eh, es necesario mencionar el acuerdo de Escazú es importante porque nos da un instrumento que nos permite avanzar más en nuestras luchas y en nuestros espacios. Si bien los gobiernos o las Naciones Unidas o, o los acuerdos que, que se dan no se están aplicando en territorio, a nosotros, las mujeres, los pueblos indígenas, nos permite tener un instrumento más para reforzar nuestras luchas. Es importante pensar en los pueblos indígenas los pueblos amazónicos, que gracias a nuestra lucha todavía existe algo de Amazonía. Si no fuera por la lucha que hemos dado, ya no existiría y no estaríamos hablando de cambio climático, no estaríamos hablando, habría una destrucción total. Y como tal, tiene que existir una responsabilidad de la sociedad civil y de toda la gente de llegar a una conciencia global de protección. Y eso es lo que Nosotros, como pueblo Sarayacu, estamos promoviendo a través de la selva viviente. Les invito a tratar de conectarse con el pensamiento y la filosofía de los pueblos indígenas para que podamos luchar de manera conjunta desde los distintos espacios, con acuerdos como el de Escazú, con los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, contra toda esta crisis climática que ya no es un cambio, sino una crisis global, para poder poner nuestro arena. Nosotros como mujeres vamos a estar al frente y estamos en el camino corto. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación a webinar en esta primera COP del Acuerdo de Escazú. Thank you so much, Patricia. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. And now we'll hear a closing comment from Ruth Spencer. Austria, I have here with me at ECLAC, Honorable Senator Maureen Hyman Payne from Antigua. And I'm gonna give her the privilege to give, my, to give the closing comments. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And all I have to say is that I've been involved with Eskazu since 2015, and it is a very important treaty because despite the diverse um, community and land spaces in, Latin American communities and the Caribbean. We've all worked together. We've all worked together to make sure that we have looked out for everyone, whether it be the women, the indigenous people, disabled people, all vulnerable groups have been accounted for. We've looked at ways to include them. And in as much as I, I feel we still have some way to go with in terms of Im implementation, what I think is important is that when we speak to community groups and um, civil society organizations that we keep repeating the message. And when I listened to Ruth speak about hope, it made me think of something. Sometimes you think you're talking to people and they're not listening and you just keep talking, they're not listening. But I want to say to you, have you ever heard a record and you've heard it the first time? You think, God, it's awful. And you keep hearing it and after a while you get to love it. And this is what I think Eskazu is about, why we keep talking about it, we keep pushing it because eventually people will come to own it. They will realize that this is for their benefit and that it doesn't matter whether you're disabled, you're black, you're white, you're indigenous, you're green, you're yellow or purple. This treaty is for you to protect the environment. It's empowering you. It helps to develop your society, the economy. I'm not just saying it because I was involved in the initial negotiations. It is a very land-breaking treaty. And I think one of the presenters said, this is a model that could be used all over the world. 
Yes, we have international treaties, and I like this because it's specific to Latin America and the Caribbean, and often we're, we're left behind by the developed countries. And it's really good that we can say, this is ours, we were the first, and it is for the future. It's for our future generations as well. It's not just for now, it's for the present and the future. And with more than those few words, I think I'll take my seat. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us in that spontaneity and good, good wishes to you. And thank you for all your hard work. We really appreciate you jumping on and thank you very much. And thank you, Ruth. I know Paloma has to leave so we can jump the line. Paloma, do you wanna have a final word before you leave if you're still with us? Maybe she left. Sim, muito obrigada, gente. Eu queria agradecer pela oportunidade. Eu queria só comentar mais uma vez que eu acho que é como já foi dito aqui, nós somos é um espaço sem fronteiras. É, a gente pensar no Acordo de Escazú como um modelo que possa servir de exemplo para diferentes partes do mundo, com acesso à informação, com proteção dos dados, das mulheres, dos ativistas, de quem está no front, é verdadeiramente uma forma da gente seguir como humanidade. E faço um apelo enorme para vocês, em nome das gerações é, jovens e das gerações futuras, de que a gente leve com seriedade, com responsabilidade, a afirmação desse acordo, o cumprimento desse acordo, e que a gente, como mulheres e como sociedade civil, possa estar e, de fato, ocupe esse, esse lugar de estar acompanhando, observando a implementação desse acordo nas nossas nações, nas nossas diferentes regiões. Basta de viver se sentindo ameaçado. Vamos agora fazer nascer, como nós mulheres, esse espaço para reflorestar mentes e reflorestar é, corações e consciências. Muito obrigada pelo convite. Thank you so much, Paloma, for joining us and thank you for your work. And I hand the floor to Patricia Miragal Cordero. Thank you. You have the floor, Patricia. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, creo que el, el, las personas que nos acompañan han hecho una reflexión sobre todo lo que nos falta por construir. Y efectivamente, el haber adoptado un texto y que los países lo hayan firmado y ya entre en vigor es parte de un proceso que ha sido exitoso pero nos queda mucho camino por, eh, por, por todavía por recorrer. Eh, tenemos que desarrollarlo y sobre todo el reto más grande, tenemos que llevarlo a la práctica y que podamos contribuir con su aplicación y su cumplimiento. Y para eso cada uno tenemos un rol muy importante que, que cumplir desde las organizaciones, desde los movimientos, a los procesos de negociación ir construyendo cómo pensamos que es la mejor forma de que esto eh, sea una, una realidad. Agradezco mucho nuevamente la oportunidad de este pensamiento eh, colectivo que incluye a diferentes países en la región y todo el esfuerzo eh, que las mujeres que eh, han desarrollado a lo largo de este proceso y de la región eh, sin duda le han puesto una, un sello distintivo a este, a este proceso. Muchas gracias, Ospi, por la oportunidad y a Carmen también de Reacción Climática. Gracias. Thank you so much for those comments and for joining us and best wishes. Uh, for you on your work on the ground there. And I'd like to hand the floor to Sonia Guajajara for her final comment. Is Sonia with us? Sonia, would you like to have a final comment? I'll come back to her. Let's go ahead and hear from Helena Gualinga. Thank you. Um, I guess I would just like to say that um, this 
disagreement is something that we, especially in this region, have never seen before. Um, and 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 again, just uh, you know, mention the importance of, of the countries to ratify and and, and to implement it. Um, and something that I can also mention is that. Um, even though we work in the spaces, for example, to promote and to push for the SCSU agreement, we also work on the ground um, to support our women on the ground and land defenders. Um, and so I, I think the link is in, in, in the chat. Um, it's a legal fund that you can support uh, and the legal fund does support um, indigenous women and the indigenous uh, female leaders um if there are uh, state of violence for example specifically to support women that are land defenders um so if that's something you'd like to support you can do that through the link um and just thank all the women that have uh that have been speaking here for all the work that they do um and uh and for for them speaking and sharing all their experiences and knowledge with us Thank you so much, Elena, for all of your work and being with us today. We really appreciate it. And we have shared the link and really lift that up and, and support that with you. Thank you very much. And uh, I will hand the floor to Carmen Caprillas for closing comment. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, well, thank you very much. I have to apologize to the translation translators because they said I was speaking too fast. So now I'll speak in, uh, in English. Uh, I really think these spaces are very important in order to keep on sharing our experiences, our points of view, and keep working together in order to achieve something bigger. Uh, this COP has been the product of almost 20 years of work around Principle 10 and uh, later the negotiations that led to the Escaso Agreement. Now we're closing this period of uh, the preparation. And like somebody asked me this morning, so what is this? Is this like the engagement? Is this like the wedding? So I, for me, this is going to be like the wedding because we are committing to something big. We are committing 12 governments to start respecting uh, environmental defenders, to start guaranteeing access to information, access to participation and access to environmental justice. So um, it is time to put our hands in action and civil society here has a great responsibility. And it's a great chance for us to start um, being together to start gathering together in order to start finding our governments accountable for what's going on on ground and strengthening our fights and our struggles against uh, extractivism. So thank you very much. Um, let's put our hands to action and let's start working in order to shift the current in and the trend in uh, the Latin American region in order to have a, a better region that really uh, takes care of the environment, really uh, can, can fulfill the right to a healthy environment uh, and that can achieve development with alternative ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen, and best wishes to you over the next days. Um, just a final call if Sonia Gajajar wanted to have a final comment before we close. Seeing Sonia, if you're there. Okay, well, I want to thank all of the participants who joined us today for your excellent questions, for your attention, and for helping us to share out this really important information. And of course, my deep thanks to the esteemed panelists for your incredible advocacy and your work over years. Uh, there will be a recording of this session available. We will be sharing out all of the links again. And I just wanted to end on a final note because someone was texting me when, when we were in this panel. And you know, one of the things I would say, they were asking me about this relationship between the Escazo Agreement and patriarchy. And what I would say to that is that, you know, we are in the fight for our lives, for Mother Earth, for lifting up women's voices who are always in every region, the backbone of these fights for forests, for water, for communities, for land, for future generations. 
and for care. And, you know, in this moment, one reflection of that, one of the manifestations, as Carmen said, after 20 years, is the Escazu Agreement. Of course, there's many different policies, but this particular one really is focused on finally an intersectional analysis to address longstanding patriarchal um, uh, values and of linking violence against the earth and violence against women that has to stop. And so when we look at the Escazu Agreement, we can see it potentially, if we implement it strong and well, and we work together to support indigenous rights, to support women land defenders, and to stop the violence against indigenous people, against land defenders, against women, against the earth. And all of those things are connected. And that's why we are so strongly standing for the Escazu Agreement, because it really addresses so many of our multiple crises, including the climate crisis, and they have to be addressed all at once. And this is an opportunity to do that. So thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate everyone's time. We wish everyone on the ground uh, all the support in the world and we'll continue this dialogue. It's an ongoing struggle and an ongoing opportunity. Thank you everyone. Thank you.